Hi everyone, welcome to this video. Now we're going to be doing All Japan. I've got a new book out called All Japan. The link is below and it's out now guys. You can go get yourself a copy. It's a relatively cheap book and it's a very easy, entertaining book to read. The way I did this was to take out the information, remove all the details and just put the flavour of the information in that you need to. So you can sit and read it or, you know, basically take one minute and have a quick story, tell a quick story to your kids. Just little bite-sized pieces of information for you to enjoy about Japan and to spread, you know, the culture of Japan around. Now, some of them are facts, some of them are legends, some of them are hearsay. It doesn't matter. It's all about getting that aroma of all Japan, whether it be a legend, a myth, a fact. It doesn't matter. So... As I say, there's the book again, get it uh, if you want, and I will now go through a few of the different things that you can find inside. The first one is the Snowstorm Raid. Now, there's a, an old warlord in Japan, very famous actually, and he was protecting the Shogun, or well, his puppet Shogun. And there was a massive snowstorm, and he was three days ride away to get to help him. So they did it in two. So you've got to imagine, the snow is blazing, you know, he's thundering through, and people died on this charge to get to him. People, horses died, people died, all to get and save the Shogun. Of course, it wasn't really to save the Shogun, it was to save his power play. But, you know, let's pretend, you know what I mean? So there you go, that's the Samurai in the Snow Raid. Now, did you know, within about 50 years of each other, possibly a bit shorter, there was actually a black samurai and a white samurai. The black samurai was from Portugal, I think, obviously, I think through the slave trade, or he was an ex-slave, or he was a descendant. We're not sure. There's not much information on him. And there's also a white samurai, which was the first English samurai to get there. Now, they're about 50 years apart. The black samurai came in the warring period, and actually entered into battles and was on full-on samurai and but again there's not much information about him and the white samurai came just as the battles ended and he became powerful and the dvd shogun is based on him and the book shogun as well so there you go we've got a black and a white samurai both non-japanese but both samurai operating in some of the coolest times in japan next is the foot of doom did you know it's extremely rude to put your foot on someone in japan point your foot at someone or anything like that. Some people say that um, one of the most famous deaths or um, attacks of a master in Japan was based because their master put their foot on their retainer, who was a high-ranking samurai, but that's only speculation. But the story we've got here is um, a bit of, I don't know if it's true, it's a bit of a myth, it was basically came up in one of the, um, the accounts of old times, uh, the ones that I've been reading from... Um, Japan. Now, the idea was that uh, a samurai got an arrow in his face and he couldn't get it out. It was locked in. So his friends put him on the floor and put a foot on his face and pulled the arrow out. But even though it saved his life or even though they got it out, he till that day pretty much enacted revenge against the samurai that put a foot on his face, even though he's helping him because you just don't do that. Crazy samurai. Did you know that there was actually English style guards, English guards actually, in Japan at the same time as samurai. So a samurai was stood next to an English army regiment guy, basically. And they used to wake up in the morning, put the bugle, the reveille, and they do all the bugles and go out, and the samurai would be there as well. They even had parades through the streets with English, like, late 1800s guards, army, basically, if you can imagine, a late 1800s army guy from England, and a samurai, and they would they actually went through the streets and um, worked together, and there was actually some scuffling that went on at certain points, but there was definitely bugles, morning routine, morning colours, whatever you want to call it, and English guards with lances, and they actually got rid of the lances because they were useless inside of the small Japanese towns, and they replaced them. So uh, there you go, there's lots of stories and lots of information in the book about the English in Japan at the same time as samurai. The first dissection of a human body for medical purposes was actually to test the, um, the validation, or to validate basically, Western body charts. So they did it in 1771. They actually cut open an old tea lady from Kyoto and then checked if everything was the right place and checked it against the, um, I think it was Dutch to be honest, I'm doing this from memory, and they checked it against them, the charts, and they were like, wow, they're really good. And they started to appreciate Western medicine.
And you may not know this, but there's actually traditional Japanese schools, Ryuha, so something Ryu, that is dedicated to Western medicine. There's a couple of them. And they used to argue with the people who were um, teaching Chinese medicine. So in the time of the samurai, you actually got two schools, like samurai sword schools, but they were medical schools. One was arguing for Chinese, old Chinese way, and one was arguing for modern Western ways, and they were both samurai, and both in the samurai times. How random. Now the drinking monk. Now there's stories of when the Jesuits came over in the 1500s, they would entertain Japanese guests and talk to them about philosophy and religion. But there was one monk who kept coming back, back and back and back, and getting more and more drunk, and he, every time they said, oh, we have that eating, We've got that too. And they say, Christ says this and say, well, our deity says that too. And when they really pressed him hard for a proper answer, he said, oh, I've got to attend to something. But the next day or the next time he'd turn up again and start drinking their wine. So basically, he just kept going getting drunk on the expense of the Jesuit monks, agreeing with them up to a certain point till he had to leave and then come back the next time and get drunk again. I've met a few Japanese monks. That's exactly what they're like. Right, the sad story of Japanese prostitutes is actually not so sad. On one hand, you've got people who wanted to be prostitutes, and on the other hand, you've got people who hated and were sold into prostitution. So there's two stories here, it's like a juxtaposition. You've got some girls who would hang around the ports where the uh, Western people were, and they would become housemaid sex objects, if you like. And they were young girls, I think they were like 14, 15, 16, and they basically put themselves in that position so that they could earn enough money to then get a decent life and get married to someone. So a lot of these young girls went to be prostitutes for a few years, and literally, like one Dutch guy would be like, right, I'll have you for a year, and he would pay X amount per week for a year, and do what, she'd clean the house, cook his food, have sex with him, and then she would, you know, once the agreement was up, she'd go off and she was free to then marry and do whatever she wanted, obviously within the Japanese restrictions, but she had a good time of it. She literally took the cash and she did it so she could further her life. But on the other hand, you get people who are sold into prostitution to prostitution houses. And uh, there's one story there by Westerners who watch. One of the girls ran away at night and they grabbed her back. They captured her. They tied her to a pole outside and beat her with bamboo until she was just bleeding and bloody and alive still. And it was a message to all the other prostitutes. Don't you dare. We own you. Because it's remember, people forget Japan is a slave, has a slave trade. And it had a slave trade for a long time. And it had a slave prostitution trade right up until pretty much 150 years ago, you know, when Westerners were there and we'd long left that behind, but they were literally owning people to make them prostitutes. So there's uh, like two sides, there's woman empowerment here and obviously, you know, like sex slavery in the same, same time. Now there's a story about uh, a guy called Mitford. Now he became a Lord, the Lord Resdale. Now the guy who actually wrote the forward to this book, I'll put his picture here, is the current Lord Reddersdale and he is still in the House of Lords and he very kindly put um, a forward for this book because he is the direct descendant of one of the guys, uh, I'll put his, this guy here, who basically is called Mitford for the book and he helped Japan enter the new times and his stories are amazing and one of them is about um, when he was in like the local area, he, um, they heard something you know, outside. So uh, they run out with revolvers and they're all ready to shoot because it was a time when white people were getting slaughtered in Japan and being killed for being white, basically. So they all had guns and knives on them, like straight outside, boom, and they come out. And it turns out it was just an otter in the garden. However, he wasn't incorrect because there was multiple times when actually they were assassins coming to assassinate them. But one of the times they just heard a dog barking and it was getting so annoying this dog that his friend pulled out his revolver shot not at the dog but near it to shut it up but it ricocheted and hit the cook in the leg and the cook went down boom and everybody's oh no i'm so sorry i'm so sorry so basically you've got this really high pressure time where they're just shooting off revolvers cooks going down assassins coming otters in the garden it sounds crazy but you should look at Lord Reddersdale and his involvement with Japan. And I'd like to publicly say thank you to the current Lord for giving us the uh, forward for the book. Did you know, technically, the Japanese emperor is actually an English knight? Yep, bizarrely. Actually, the emperor is part of the order, one of the chivalric orders, which are, they are knighted and put into the chivalric order. I'm not saying that the emperor is actually a knight. What I'm saying is he's in a knight's chivalric order. So it's a bit of a crazy thing. But this caused a problem because 
it, a lot of the times they're given um, sort of titles just, you know, to give them titles. And in World War II, the Japanese emperor was actually a high-ranking British army officer and a knight of England. And then they went to war with him. So he's technically the head so the sovereign, head of state of another country that they're at war with, but who's an officer in the English army. And he's also a knight of England, the English realm, the British realm. And it's like, oh, what do we do? So they took his knighthood away, took his commission away. And after the war, they had to, about the 1970s, they had to sort of give him back. <laughs> so but I think it was the next emperor by that point. But my point is, is like the emperor is actually on paper an English knight and was an army officer in the British army. To stop ants crawling up tables, what people used to do in old Japan was put a bowl of water under each leg. So they put the leg in the bowl like that and then fill it with water and the ants would go over and they couldn't get past the water and come back. So what it did is stop ants getting onto the table and eating everything. Pretty good. Now we just kill them with chemicals, but you know, it was not a bad way of doing it. Okay, the mad samurai. Now, um, in certain times in Japanese history, basically a samurai could get away with killing those directly below him, like his family members. If he wanted to kill his children, he could kill them. You know, he had dominion over the people inside of his life. But it's only at certain periods, it gets quite complex. But overall, in certain situations, a samurai could kill his own family if he wanted. So, what we had here is a samurai was full of fever and he was delirious and he picked up his sword and started hacking people down, servants, everything. He just was thought they were enemies, we don't know, he just went nuts. And But afterwards, when he came back and he was all, you know, refreshed and happy, they couldn't, he found out he killed his family or wounded most of them and killed a few. And actually, they couldn't do anything about it, he didn't go to prison, wasn't executed, simply because they were his family, do what he wanted with them. You know, remember, people owned people in old Japan. I was saying that slavery was still involved, or very hard connecting ties were there. So it was quite a problematic, and you couldn't annoy the people above you. That's why you get a lot of side branches detaching from main branch so they can start their own, and it gets quite complicated like that. But I've simplified everything in this book, so that's an, an example of what we do in the book. I hope you enjoyed that. I want to say thank you again to Lord Reddersdale because he did the forward and it was very kind of him. And um, hopefully I get to meet him one day in London, which will be very nice. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Get yourself a copy of the book. It's very interesting, very fun. It's just fun little myths, legends and facts. And uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. And I'll see you next time, guys.